Final speaker of the day, it's my pleasure to welcome um, Tom Cully from Publons. I said, how should we introduce you? And he said, uh, sort of wandering Kiwi who's a bit lost, so we'll go with that. Um, but we'll now sort of return to talk more about peer review and hopefully pick up some of the things that we didn't quite get to finish uh, in Jen's talk. So I will let Georgina mic Tom up and hand you over to him. Well, um, before I forget, I thank you very much, uh, Hannah and the Cambridge team, for having me along. Uh, it's nice to come up here. Uh, that Wonderful. Thanks so much. Um, so I'm Tom um, from Publons, and um, there's already been a couple of references to us today and a lot of talk about peer review, which is absolutely great. But quick show of hands, who knows what Publons is and does? Okay, brilliant. Only a few that don't. So hopefully by the end of this, um, everyone will know exactly what it is that we do. So a couple of things I want to talk about today. Um, first, just to kind of frame what it is and what we do in our mission is um, what I call the skewed system, um, the skewed kind of research communication system and the role of peer review in that. Uh, and then the importance of recognizing review and trying to bring some balance back to that system. Uh, and then I want to touch on the Publons Academy, um, which is about training for peer review and then <clears throat> we'll take some questions at the end. So the skewed system. So there's I'm not a researcher, first of all, um, and so this is kind of a very oversimplified way of framing what it is that a researcher does. And you don't have to agree with it, but it's just to uh, make my point. It's kind of two roles for a researcher. One is to conduct novel research and try and discover the truth um, and propel you know, society forward through all those great novel discoveries. The other is to interpret others' research, and this is where peer review fits in. And it's really important because that is our core quality assurance mechanism for research. It helps to filter out the bad stuff, surface the good stuff, and make sure that we can disseminate validated, trustworthy, credible research. Um, and there's a heavy consensus that peer review is by far and away the uh, gold standard for um, uh, maintaining quality control in the uh, research communication system. And there's many, many surveys that point to this, and this is just a recent one. Uh, actually, it might be a couple of years old now. 84% um, of researchers uh, polled, 4,000 researchers polled by Sense About Science believe that without peer review, there would be no control in scientific communication. So peer review is at the heart of the system. But you wouldn't really know it if you take a step back. And I'm going to talk specifically about the incentives in play for researchers, the people that conduct the research, and we also rely upon to uh, perform that quality control task of peer review. And the problem is that if you look at the incentives, everything for a researcher drives them to publish almost at any cost. And it's all because you are rewarded with the very tangible rewards of career progression, funding, and things like that for the most part, for your citation record and your publication record. And there's absolutely very minimal, well, not absolutely, but very minimal incentive to review because it is uh, relied upon that you do it as a service to your community and giving back um, and to play your part or a quid pro quo kind of arrangement that if you do yours, then other people will review for you. The problem with this is that it, there's a big imbalance there, very tangible rewards for doing one thing and kind of just a reliance and trust system that you'll carry out review. And there's some really big problems in the research system at the moment uh, that are starting to manifest, and this imbalance contributes to those problems manifesting. So we've already touched on today some of the previous speakers, the reproducibility crisis, Publons or salami slicing, that's where the name Publons come from. Uh, it's basically, if you, are to, if you aren't familiar, cut up a research paper into as many publishable articles as possible. Increasing rejections, instances of misconduct and fraud. On the review side, you've got a slow review process which slows down the dissemination of vetted research. And you've got reviewer fatigue because we've got uh, a small pool of willing reviewers uh, and lots and lots more submissions. So in order to kind of understand what we'd need to do to bring some balance back to the system, 
good to take a bit of a snapshot of what is involved in peer review. So this is, in any one year, you've got about 4 million reviewers carrying out about 7 million reviews over about 35 million hours. And there was a, a scholarly kitchen article that tried to quantify this in monetary terms and about $2.5 billion of unrecognized peer review being carried out each year. So that's pretty amazing when you look at it, the fact that we rely on this as the key quality assurance mechanism in the system, yet there's all this unaccounted for, unrecognized work that is kind of driving it. And everything else on the other side is saying, publish almost at any cost, which is fueling these other issues in the system. So what we do at PubLons is we're trying to create a way to bring some balance back to the system. And rather than looking at the problems, we look at it as a great opportunity. We want to try and speed up research, both in terms of the pace at which we uh, are able to communicate qualified, trustworthy, credible research that's been reviewed, um, and ensure that the quality increases as well by harnessing the true power of peer review. So how do we do that? So at the very heart of it, what we do is we've created a platform which enables you to track and verify and effortlessly keep a record every single peer review that you perform across all the world's journals. This is what a profile looks like. This is the world's most prolific reviewer, Jonas Ranslam. He's actually a uh, semi-retired medical stati uh, statistician. And he, I think last year, did about 800 and something reviews. Um, it's all he does. He'll do a few a day. Uh, so I wouldn't expect anyone else to be at that level. But basically, it's a free profile um, for researchers where you can sign up and you can add records of reviews that you've done for any journal across the world. Now, we make it really easy by partnering with the world's publishers so that as you perform the review, you tick a box and the record is automatically added to your PubLons profile. If we haven't partnered with that particular publisher or journal just yet, you can still add the reviews. You just have to forward the thank you for reviewing email receipt that you'd get from an editor to us, and it would be verified in the background because we go and check that it actually occurred, and then the record's added to your profile, or you can manually add it through the site. And again, so I'll just quickly show you this is what it looks like. There's green ticks all down here showing that these have been verified. If it's not verified, there wouldn't be a green tick. But you start to build a picture of exactly how many reviews people are doing, where they're doing them, who's doing them, these sorts of things. And it's kind of building that benchmarking platform to start bringing some recognition to the peer review process. So here's a little snapshot of who we partner with so far. We've got over uh, a thousand journals already integrated into the platform. Uh, I think it's about 120,000 odd reviewers on the site, about 600,000 or a little more reviews on the site, and about 5,000 editors using the site. So the other thing we do is you can track your editorial contributions as well. So anytime you handle a manuscript as an editor for a journal, you can add a record of that to Publons as well, so you're getting recognition for that valuable work. Um, so in any given week, we would add about I think it's about 2,500 new researchers to the site, about 12 to 15,000 new review records. Um, so it's, it's growing pretty quickly. Um, so one thing that often crops up now is, well, what does this mean in terms of, are you taking the content of my review? Am I publishing the content of the review? How does all that work? Um, and so there's a number of different permission settings here. And we try to take into account the preferences of all the different parties in play. So a lot of publishers will run a double blind or blind reviewing process. They don't want the content of reviews published. Uh, a lot of researchers do want to publish the content of their review. They are all about open access, open review, trying to move along those lines. So we try and take all of that into account and come up with a, uh, a balanced approach. So reviewers can set their own preferences about whether they want to sign their name to their review or publish the content or both, or just leave it all blind and anonymous. Publishers can then set their own settings about whether they want reviewers to be able to sign the names to the reviews, publish the content, all of that. At this point in time, the publisher or journal settings will take precedence, so in the hierarchy of preferences. If a reviewer says, I want to publish the content and sign my name, but the publisher settings say, no, we don't want that to happen, then it would simply show the year of the review, the green tick, and the name of the journal that it was performed for. That's it. But in the background, we're collecting all this data which can help to inform publishers and journals how many people want to be able to sign and publish their reviews, which could help seed change further, further down the line. 
um, and the default settings is always blind and unpublished. So you have to go in and manually change your settings if you want to be able to sign your name to review and publish the content. And again, a bit more of a um, zoomed in view of what that would look like on the profile with sort of a variety of the different types here. So we've got some post-publication reviews that you can go in and actually read the content. We've got some verified pre-publication reviews with the most basic settings and then some of the more open settings for these ones where the, the, the journal and the publisher have allowed the content and the name of the manuscript to be published there that was reviewed. Now we're very aware of the online burden um, for researchers so these, these days, so many different tools, so many different profiles, all this sort of stuff. So we try to make it as, as automated and simple as possible, hence the um, ability to just one click to have an automatic record updated on your profile when you do the review. But we also do things like uh, we integrate with Orchid, so you can just check a box in your profile and your review record will be automatically synced on your Orchid account as well. So you don't have to go across and be updating all these different things a million different times. Um, two clicks and you get to your exportable verified peer review record. So this is what you can include in your CV or performance evaluation, anything like that. It's a verified record of your peer reviews uh, and you can customize the dates or the, the detail of what you want to have shown in that verified peer review record. And then we also have a bunch of exclusive statistics and insights and comparisons. Um, and this is because if you really want to start uh, recognizing the importance of review and the reviewers that are doing the work, it's nice to have some benchmarks. Uh, so we're able to show some things like how you compare in terms of the word count of your reviews across other people in your field or at your institution, the average impact factor of journals that you're reviewing for versus others, uh, your total reviews over time, your review to publication ratio, uh, how often the papers that you review go on to be published. Um, we'll notify you of when a paper you've reviewed has been published send you an email, um, heaps of interesting stuff. And all of this helps if you want to go and put your verified review record in a performance uh, evaluation or a funding application, things like that, to show where you stand. There's some context to uh, your reviewing efforts. Um, and this is all to try and help researchers stand out. A lot of people say, well, this is all well and good, but because of the heavily skewed system that rewards me for publishing and publishing only, how is this information actually going to help me get ahead? And part of this is a legacy issue, the fact that there hasn't been a way to measure all of this stuff in the past, so it hasn't been given due attention by people uh, holding the purse strings or making the decisions at institutions or at funding agencies. But what we've found is that by creating a measurable output for peer review, that a bunch of institutions already do take this into account. Problem is it was always underreported or lacked evidence or didn't, it was fragmented, it was um, you know, my name published in a journal at the end of the year, or I've got a certificate from this publisher over here saying I reviewed. Now you've got it in one place, it's verified, it's evidence, and so you can use this in a number of instances already. And there's some case studies on our site and some guidance about exactly how you can do that. And I got this quote the other day from uh, Professor Alan Stitt. He's at the Queen's University in Belfast, and he just sent me an email. He'd been going through uh, the latest tenure promotion round and he saw a bunch of people had included their Publons verified record and he sent me this lovely quote to say that you know they actually do value this evidence and it counts towards something. It's a reflection of the researchers standing in their field because they're trusted to review um, and it's just a great way to be able to measure their contributions and service as well. Now that's all well and good um, but how can it compete with the very real tangible incentives for uh, for publishing, um, which is actually going to help you advance your career. And it just seems like a, a you know, very unfair fight if you're saying we still need way more people to peer review, take it much more seriously, uh, and improve the quality of it if we're going to rebalance this system overall. But everything is compelling you to research, uh, so to publish research. Um, almost at any cost, and just telling me that I can now include my verified peer review record isn't really going to compel me to either put in more effort into reviewing or review at a high quality across the board. So what we're trying to do and get researchers to help us to do is get the people in those uh, decision-making 
physicians to start taking this seriously. If world ranking bodies, if institutions, if uh, funders all started factoring in and giving greater weight to the peer review contributions of the researchers that are in charge of vetting and validating and bringing trust and credibility to research, then potentially we might be able to bring some real balance back to the system. And we're starting doing that by, we've got a, a few things in, in play. We've got a university leaderboard in terms of which universities are uh, carrying out the most review, how open is their review system, all these sorts of things. So it's just a way to try and show that if you're a world ranking body, you want to see who are the best performing universities in the world or the most prestigious, perhaps peer review should factor into that. How do they perform? So this is all good. Um, if we can build this platform of recognition for reviewers, but what does that mean for the future of peer review? Um, and I really like the way that Nicholas framed this before in terms of if you could have a place where you could have a network of experts, you understand their credentials, and they can all start evaluating research in a very open manner, then you can really make some strides forward. And so this is kind of how I think about it, which is you've got this platform built on adequate recognition of the peer review process, and then you've got this network of experts um, all in one central hub who can start discussing and evaluating the world's research, um, bring extra context and insight to those findings and surface the real breakthroughs and everything like that. Is it open? I think that's kind of an open question. Um, personally, I would like for it to be open, but there's so many different, uh, I guess, parties with different incentives at play now. It remains to be seen, but quality. We've got to improve the quality as well. So I think if you've got a network looking to try and bring transparency to the system, possibly through a completely open system, then that would drive greater quality in the peer review process. Greater quality and peer review means greater quality of research. So that's what I kind of like to think of as trying to build the future. But it all sits on this platform of properly and formalizing, <laughs> in a formal way, recognizing peer review. So another thing that we do on the platform is post-publication peer review. So again, one centralized place. You can go and you can add any post-publication comments to any research article in the world. And we've got uh, Lots of these on the site already. Uh, and when you do that, you can score the publication and you can add comments as well. Um, so here's a couple of the different metrics that we show down here for this is a post publication of, there's I think about 10 post publication reviews for this one uh, that came on late last year about the uh, limits to human lifespan, which was a really interesting article. And simple way to do it, you just go to your dashboard to a quick preview of what that looks like, import any article using its DOI write your post-publication review, and then it will show up on your profile here using your um, personal display preferences, and then anyone can go on today and browse thousands of post-publication reviews on the site, and you can filter them using a number of different settings here. Um, so that's a little bit about the platform and about the system and how we think bringing some recognition to the reviewing process might help to bring some balance back to that system. But how do you become a reviewer? And so uh, Cambridge University Press team touched on this before. So we're thinking about this a little bit differently. Um, there's a, an enormous pool of early career researchers who probably want to review because it's great. It gives you access to some of the latest research in your field. Um, it might help you to become a better author. It's potentially a pathway to becoming uh, an editor on an editorial board. But they simply haven't been asked to review because the main way you get asked to review these days is if you've already published. And if you're an early career researcher, that you know, is very difficult um, to be able to publish and, and then start reviewing. It's kind of a chicken egg situation. So then on the other side, you've got editors who have a small reviewer pool. It is the, the number one problem that editors tell us they have is finding willing reviewers, recruiting them and getting them to say, yes, I want to review. So there's this disconnect there. We've got a bunch of people who want to review, a bunch of editors who need to find people to review, but they're not connecting up with each other. And part of the problem is, one, accessing this pool of, um, comp of reviewers, but two, how do they prove that they're actually a competent reviewer and good enough? So the solution that we're proposing is 
helping early career researchers demonstrate their competency as an expert and as a reviewer. So we've developed an online course to um, teach the fundamental core competencies of reviewing. Involve your supervisor, so it's someone you already know and already trust and already work with, so you can practice doing real post-publication reviews of papers in your field. Build a Publons profile at the same time. And then become endorsed by your supervisor at the end. So you've been signed off as a graduate. Your supervisor can vouch for the fact that you're competent enough to start reviewing papers in your field. And then editors can come to this uh, platform find uh, these new reviewers who are willing and motivated to review and easily evaluate their skills because they've got the profile there, they've got the endorsement. And so we call that the Publons Academy. Um, it's going to launch in I think about five or six weeks. We're taking pre-enrollments now. Um, and 10 modules on demand, go online, bunch of videos, a few practice sessions, Take your time, do it as long as you, you know, as long as it takes you to do it. Um, and then once you're a graduate, the publisher side of what we do, uh, you will become uh, noticeable on the publisher dashboard that we have. And you can also register yourself as an interested reviewer, even if you're not a Publons Academy graduate, if you're just a Publons user, you can go to any of the journals that we partner with on our site and register, register yourself as an interested reviewer if you want to uh, review for their journals. So here's kind of what it looks like. Here's an early career researcher that we worked with uh, middle of last year. Go through the Publons Academy, and that's what your profile would look like afterwards. Endorsement by a supervisor, a number of verified post-publication reviews, and a little badge showing that you're a graduate of the Academy. It's a great way to kind of start building your profile as an early career researcher if publishing is a kind of that hard path to get to because it takes a lot of work to become uh, an accomplished published author. And we have thousands of editors on the platform, both uh, in terms of people getting recognition for their editorial efforts if they're academic editors, or if they are editors for journals or publisher administrators and they're looking to find reviewers or potentially looking to source people to join editorial boards. So you can get in front of these people. Don't know how we're doing for time. Perfect. So quick recap. Um, great opportunity to improve the quality of research and the pace at which we can disseminate vetted, trustworthy research if uh, we can bring balance back to the system by using modern tools to turn peer review into a me measurable research output that people take seriously and give due uh, recognition and reward. And it's going to take all players in the research ecosystem to recognize and reward peer review relative to its importance. Um, that starts with researchers um, using these things to try and put it in front of the people that are going to help them uh, progress their careers and do all these sorts of things. And then hopefully that is going to persuade the decision makers and the people who hold the purse strings to change the way that they approach peer review as well. What does the future of peer review look like? Hopefully it's uh, comprised of a network of experts willing to discuss and evaluate the world's research to expand the cone of discovery and progress. And this network needs to be built on a foundation of recognition. And then early career researchers are the future. We need to help them show their reviewing expertise and become expert reviewers, active reviewers. And that's me. Hey, many thanks, Tom. Were there any questions for Tom? Yeah, haven't seen anything too alarming in terms of people not willing to review for certain journals. Um, we don't actually see a lot 
of the invitation process. Um, we'll see it once a review has been accepted, uh, and that's when we know, that's when we can start tracking things, basically. Um, so it's re really hard to say, but in terms of kind of adding the metrics around it or gamesmanship type things, you know, we have a merit score, so if you review more, your merit goes up and you get uh, more merit for doing different things on the site. So we're really, really careful, and, and we're going through a process right now of trying to make sure that people can't game that system or place too much emphasis on it. You know, it's a nice way there to keep track of how you compare and have some benchmarking tools to be able to see what your performance is like across your field or your institution, all these other things. But um, at the end of the day, we're really trying to focus on the quality of peer reviews and making sure that we've got a great pool of expert willing reviewers who are going to perform great quality peer reviews. So if you've got a bunch of people coming in just doing one-liners, uh, that's not used to anyone. So that's the benefit, I guess, as well of an, uh, an open system. You can start uh, bringing that transparency and accountability to people who are maybe just trying to game the system and say, look at me, I review a lot for high impact factor journals or whatever it is, but really they're just one-liners. It's not used to, of any use to the editors or the authors or anything like that. Um, so factoring in openness is one thing, um, and then also just being really, really clear about our, our metrics and, and the purpose of those metrics and having the belts and braces in there to make sure people can't game it. I don't know, does that answer the question? I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the, my background is uh, policy, in fact, and, and quite often when um, you're looking at market failure or system failure, you want to intervene some way, um, then you might end up swinging the pendulum too far the other way, and that can just create more and more problems. So it's very much got to be a considered kind of, just make sure we've got the right amount of review, review happening. Yeah. Those are very helpful. And, and I mean, following up on this, on this question, I see what happens when there is an open evaluation? Or let's say, for example, coupled with um, an instant publication and then later on peer review. How many of these actually get uh, peer reviewed? Do you have any uh, statistics on, on information regarding if it is a not preprint or if instant publications are going to actually get, get into the peer review, if there is an uniformity in terms of getting given attention to the articles that seem to be more peppier, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Uh, uh, or let's say boring, for example, confirmatory articles that get into peer review. And I mean, in that, and this seems like you have a lot of data, and do you do any meta research? That uh, what happens to this number one journal from whatever the reviewer? How does he or she to have eight hundred twenty-five peer review peer review sites? And how many of these extremely prolific researchers actually lead to policy reviews? Mm -hmm. uh, do things appear in your first publication review of the articles that are reviewed by others? Uh, so the question is: it's not just it looks it looks extremely impressive in terms of how of how good is the quality of mm. you have data to measure the impact of these peer review mm. sites. Mm. Um, so two things. One is Publons right now is really, really good at measuring the quantity of review. Mm. Um, and that's kind of step one. But I think the broader question here is how do you measure the quality of review? Um, because that is kind of the, the the black box here, and if you can make sure across the board that we are improving the quality of peer review, then that's going to be really, really useful. So we are doing a couple of things in that area. So uh, at the end of last year, we introduced what we called excellent reviews. And this is a way, excellent reviews. So it's a gold star that would go next to any peer review that has been rated excellent by the editor who received it. So the editor has a form, and we went out and did a bunch of research with about 400 editors saying, what is it that makes an, a review outstanding to you? And we narrowed that down to four different criteria. It's thoroughness, helpfulness, uh, quality. I, I can give you the exact stuff. But if it reaches, reaches a certain threshold, then that is deemed an excellent review, and that would get credit for that. And so we start to build uh, the basis for understanding and, and maybe getting some metrics around how many great quality reviews are we, get, are we getting. We can already look at word count and things like that, and those are kind of some proxy measures, but 
this is more of a direct measure. And then a few of our publisher partners are looking at how some of the quality systems that they have in place might map to that so we can start building a uniform um, approach to looking at quality. And then the second thing I'll say is um, in terms of preprints, we actually had, uh, I can't remember the researcher's name, but late last year, uh, middle of last year, uh, there was a researcher who put a paper on the archive and then came onto Publons and solicited peer reviews for that paper, got the peer reviews from the experts he found on the network, and then approached the journal and said, I've already got these peer reviews, these are the reviewers, here's the reviews, and managed to get published that way. So that's the kind of thing that we can possibly look at happening more and more with um, preprints. The question is more about the papers get peers. So the papers that come from different peers, mm. do they attack similar things? And that is extremely important. When you go in the direction of uh, uh, free publication, uh, free review, Free peer review publication, and we rely on expertise uh, uh, going to look at this data and then just evaluate. But what if it's not interesting? What if it's boring? Mm -hmm. What if it's not worth my time? Right. So, do people give similar advice? So, how can we ensure that? Are you talking about the post publication review kind of functionality? Post yeah, post publication yeah. Yeah. review, right. and then peer review can sort of work. Yeah. So, um, for post publication review stuff, I'm it would be really interesting to look at the kind of attention we get um, on there. And it's a part of the um, platform that there isn't a great amount of awareness around at this point. We're just trying to build that out. The first part was the recognition side. And now this post-publication peer review functionality. Um, we did an experiment late, late last year. We went out and solicited people. Hey, did you know you can do this? Come on and review for your favorite article. Um, we'd do things like look at the uh, top ranking altmetric um, articles, research articles for the last year, and go out and see if we could get people to come and add post-publication reviews for those articles last year. Um, and we did. We got the, it was a lot of interest. Um, but I think it's still in the very early stages to be able to tell whether, you know, if we had great awareness of it, certain fields would attract the amount of kind of post-publication peer review that you're looking for, and then compare that across fields. Um, so yeah, early days, but possibly too too early to tell. Okay, thank you very much. Any last questions for Tom? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so free for researchers. Um, at the moment, publishers have a really big problem. Um, and the way that they kind of articulate that problem is getting review done. It's really hard to get review done. Um, because a lot of people just don't have the time. They're inundated with uh, you know, a really full inbox of review invitations. Um, and then you know, it might take six months, a year, for a paper to go through the process. So that's a really big problem. And part of that is the fact that reviewers don't get the recognition they deserve for the time that they're putting into it. So publishers pay us money to integrate um, with Publons and have this automated system for recognizing reviewers. And then on the publisher dashboard, they can start to get a better understanding of their peer review processes and behavior, and they get access to this pool of uh, re researchers um, that they might be able to contact for, for viewing later on. Uh, we don't give away any personal private information, anything like that. It's more kind of at the meta level. OK, thank you very much. So we could just thank Tom again. That was really interesting. Okay, so thank you all very much for coming along today. I think it's been a really interesting session this morning, um, hearing a lot about peer review and also about the sort of wider problems um, in research communication at the moment. I think most of our speakers are hanging around for lunch, and I can see that the sandwiches have been delivered at the back, so I'm not going to speak for too long, because um, I don't want to sort of hold you from your lunch. But I just want to say thank you very much to Hannah and Marta, who did a lot of the coordinating work for this morning, um, and thank you all very much for coming along. Okay, thanks.